super nervous because actually I think the real experts are sitting in the audience. So always keep in mind I'm just a computer scientist, okay? And tell me what I'm doing wrong, everything is fine. Um, so, so, but actually it's, it's super exciting to be here and actually to work in this field, at, at least in, in, in my opinion, even as a computer scientist. And I think this is because there's this new trend um, and I think it's a last long uh, uh, standing trend that we will make decisions jointly, right? We will do it jointly with people, data and computers. <laughs> and it's up to us to understand how much the computer should do it, how much should the data do it, how much should the people do it. Um, but that's what we can manage. And this is all because data, at least some people would typically say it's the new oil. But I'm not so much into oil industry, so I'd like more to really say it's about soil and helping the planet to survive. And if we agree on that, then somehow then AI as a cover term for machine learning, data science, whatever you want to uh, feel it is AI, is somehow providing the tools to turn this data into knowledge, to harvest somehow what we are growing on the soil. And the standard motivation, and you saw that already in the great talks we, see in the, uh, we saw in the morning, is somehow that we have to think about how can we improve um, crop production um, so that we can all still feed somehow the hungry world. So in particular here, the idea is how can data science and AI help? And this is actually going back uh, quite eight years by now. Um, I still recall when I was in Bonn and Jens Leon was somehow telling me here is a lot of data and our task is somehow can we understand earlier or predict earlier um, that a plant is suffering from some stress um, earlier than a human by the naked eye. So that was somehow um, the idea and maybe you can do it on the uh, sixth day after inoculation or after stress was happening and the question was can we do that somehow non-invasively earlier and actually this question it's already much older than uh, in a sense me starting working on that and you have one of the experts now here in Göttingen as well um, Anne sitting somewhere in the back well not so much in the back but anyhow um, so the idea is for example that you could use hyperspectral images um, to do that right so you can look a little bit so to say inside uh, the plant here so the problem there is, there are actually many problems in the world. One of them is if you start measuring plants on a hyperspectral um, level, which means you take a, not an RGB image like in your cameras, but you're not just having three wavelengths, but maybe thousands of wavelengths. So you have a much larger um, data set here. So problem is if you now take 10 plants and seven measurement stays, you may easily get into something that you can't handle with a single machine easily because you have already a terabyte of data, at least back then. Now, maybe it's a little bit easier. Um, but actually, if you think of the industry also behind it, and if you think, for example, of Lambda Tech or other companies, then they would like to do that at a much higher rate, right? So we would like to have this high throughput um, phenotyping, and then we are talking even maybe about um, petada uh, petabytes of data per day. And then the question is, how can we do it? So um, as a data scientist, it's rather simple how you can do it. At least that's what I thought in the beginning, being a big-headed, you know, young computer scientist. You just say, OK, give me these data cubes. Um, you treat them uh, to simplify as matrices, so you stack them on top of each other. And then actually, you put everything on top of each other, and you just say, OK, this is one big data matrix. And now I apply whatever the toolbox is giving me. And, in the beginning, for example, there was the idea that you run a principal component analysis. So for those who don't know that, it's essentially you're taking your data and you try to rotate the data in a way that the axes are corresponding to the axis of highest variance of most information, in a sense, right? So um, you can view that a little bit more graphically, like taking a data matrix and transforming it into two hopefully smaller data matrices, where one of the data matrices is telling you new insights, new features, on how to rep uh, represent your data. And the other matrix is how you represent really your data. So hopefully you get some insights because you have the information bottleneck, right? So somehow what is important remains. However, the problem is, and it was again Jens Leon, he was looking at me saying, Christian, yeah, yeah, I understand what is PCA, but I don't understand what is the biological meaning of an eigenvector. 
And that's the first time, you know, you, you're a data scientist and you just get data and you typically just massage it somehow. It's the first time where you start thinking about is the toolbox we have really what we want. Um, second problem there was that I said, don't worry, Jens. Uh, I don't care. We can use other techniques and we can subsample the data so that we are not running the issue of the big data set anymore. And then we can use something else than PCA. And then he was saying, no, no, Christian. Don't tell me subsampling because then I have to tell my students, you know, from the, I don't know, 300 days I'm sending them out into the fields to take data, I could have sent them only out for 20 days. That's not a good idea. So even sampling, at least in the beginning, is not a good idea. So a lot of your toolbox, standard toolbox, is not easily applying. So we had to come up with something new, and we were a little bit inspired by uh, Leo Bryman, who was inventing, I think now 20 years ago, um, what is called archetypical analysis. And the idea is a little bit like these glasses you see here. So, you know, if you look at these three glasses, you explain them not by saying there are 200 milliliters of liquid in there of water. You're more saying it's half full, it's half empty. You're, you're just trying to express everything uh, as a convex combination of the two extremes you see on the left and right hand side. Uh, convex meaning um, that they always add up to one. So the same idea we had here now, so we would like to take the data, and now imagine that you take a rubber band, and you put this rubber band around your data, you compute what is called the convex hull, or the fringe of the convex hull to be mathematically precise, and now on these rubber bands, wherever it uh, touches a data point, um, they become your new features, and now our, your new basis, and now you can express all other data points, as convex combinations of these hopefully few data points on the rubber band, right? And that's nice because now, first of all, I can say, look, these um, archetypes you have measured. So if there are measurement errors, not my problem, but you have measured. You understand what you have done there. And we can even explain all others in there by what you have measured. So that was very good for us because people were not asking like Jens, um, okay, what is the biological meaning of an eigenvector, right? This has instantly biological meaning. So there are some other interesting <laughs> properties. Actually, we were able to show how to compute that in linear time, at least with a certain information um, on a guarantee on a relative bound. So you can also characterize in a mathematical term what we are computing. But it's really working in linear time, so you can easily scale it to billions of signatures. So the terabyte of data was not an issue anymore. Next to some issues on how to handle the data. And it was working. So here you see, for example, if you now take this rubber band, you look at the guys that are on the convex hull, um, and then you can look at these extreme candidates you have found, and we looked at those on the convex hull that explain the most the data, and then you see three typical hyperspectral signatures, which make very much sense because this data was about drought stress. So you have the healthy spots, but then you also have the dying out parts happening, right? So that was pretty interesting because we just got the data set, right? We had, at that point, no biologist next to us, and it still was making sense. Um, and you can afterwards also see, yeah, it makes even more sense because it's mainly about pigments. So then you can develop that because now you can count how many pixels in your hypercube or in your, in your hyperspectral image belong to a certain class of your archetypical uh, points, right? So you can measure, so to say, how many are kind of healthy, how many are about to die out, how many are plain dead. And so that's what we did here, and we called then the difference between healthy and plain dead. Uh, the drought gap, and just to remind you, humans on average were able to distinguish uh, drought stressed and not um, and healthy plant on the sixth measurement day, and with the machine we were able to get significant differences here um, three measurement days earlier. So in terms of time, uh, this means we gain about a week. But I was more interested in this technology than afterwards because it gives you also a way to um, do statistical machine learning. So you have your rubber band, right? So now in mathematics, that means you can describe distributions because these rubber bands can be viewed as a simplex. And there are very classical distributions for, uh, on the simplex. And one of them is the Dirichlet. So don't wonder, don't worry about formulas. We will not go into formulas. But distances are great because, uh, distributions are great because with distributions, you can have, for example, distances. 
So what you can do now is you can compute, so to say, the distribution per measurement day or per plant and measurement day. And based on the distributions, you can ask now how far away are these distributions from each other. So um, here we were using, uh, which one were we using? Achararai distance, I guess. But anyhow, you can use several of them. And then you can use the distances to get an embedding into the two-dimensional uh, two Euclidean space. And so what you see here is how the different images taken develop over time, in a sense. And you see, uh, we call it only um, green and red afterwards. You can see that uh, initially the healthy and the stressed plants behaved somehow similar, but at some certain point they diverged and they took different trials, in a sense, in this low dimensional space. So that's also interesting because now, given that you have a geometric representation of your data, you can also try to even simplify further and using some other techniques, you can compute, for example, <laughs> metro maps, which makes it very simple to understand what is going on. So it's essentially the same what you saw before, but now you can identify every single plant or type of plant um, and, um, um, so to say, hyper, hyperspectral dynamics in there as a certain um, tube line. And when they meet, that doesn't mean that you can go over to the different trial, but it just means that they're very similar at that point, right? So it's still, a, a, again, about distances. And then you can see that there are really differences in the visible part and in the non-visible part and so on. So then with Anne, we were also showing that, of course, you can disapply also on the microscopic scale because it's all about the data, right? We are just abstracting the data into distribution, so you can also do that on that scale, and you can also um, compare, and by that also show differences to QTLs and so on. But this is really where I would uh, refer you to, to Anne when it's more on the biological part. Now, it's not only about descriptive phenotyping here, you can also do predictive uh, phenotyping. So now again, keep in mind, we have distributions. These distributions have certain hyperparameters. Uh, don't worry why they are called hyper. We, we can also call them parameters, it's enough here, but they have parameters. And now, I mean, you know, you change a little bit the parameter, the shape of the distribution change. So now what you can do is you can to, uh, put on top of these parameters a statistical model, uh, we were in particular using a Gaussian process, don't worry again what that is, to learn, so to say, how these parameters change over time, and by that also how at least the statistics change over time. And then you can use this model and you can train it again from data using what is called um, stochastic expect uh, expectation maximization training, and then you can do predictions into the future using these Gaussian processes. And that's what you see here. Don't be scared that this is going into, or um, is starting to go into a plateau that is coming be, uh, from the fact that we have to use a so-called Boltzmann distribution. So they have to sum up to one again, and therefore, you know, it can't go further and further down. But you can see that we can predict now even earlier to distinguish between control plans, stress plans, and really so to say, that plans. So, and we are gaining actually another three days. So um, just by making a little bit more interesting machine learning, um, we can predict now earlier, even earlier than in the descriptive case. Now, keep in mind, my main goal was to have it in an interpretable fashion, and this is really unique in your field. So typical machine learner, will just take data, does some predictions, doesn't care about interpreting uh, the model. I'm accelerating here a little bit. But working with plant physiologists really means your data and your results has to be meaningful or have to be meaningful. So instead of saying we are going now for a simplified statistical model, we could also first try to massage the data a little bit, simplify the data, and then putting maybe a completely different model on top. So this was the idea here. So what we noticed is talking to Anne and other people is that quite often they are not very interested in the reflectance values in your hyperspectral um, image, which means how much energy is reflected at a certain spot. They were not interested in the third, fourth, fifth digit. Right? So why not quantizing simply and saying they are just 100 different reflectance energy values. So 0, 1, 2, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 100 and we call them a word, right? So essentially one of these signatures you saw there, you can see that as a sentence. 
where the plant is telling you, okay, at that spot, you know, I'm seeing this reflectance value, and in the next wavelength, I'm seeing this word, and so on, and so on. So why is that interesting? At least it was very interesting to me, because now I can take over all the technology our field has developed to understand documents. And if you have ever used Google News, for example, and wondered why, although there are millions of news articles, you only see few of them, this is exactly because they do clustering in a very specific way to present you only topics that are really interesting to you. So and this is called um, a topic model or a probabilistic topic model. You see the model here again, don't worry to understand. Um, but we were applying that there and from my side, the main uh, challenge was how to get it scaled to the big data case there. Um, you could do an unroll over several GPUs or servers, but here we didn't have was a German university, so we didn't have the, the machinery, so we had to develop a little bit more algorithms, um, a, spe a specific one here. Anyhow, it was working, so i um, not sure you can see it well, but again, these are the words now, again, uh, represented as a hyperspectral signature, and the darker, the more you expect it, the, the higher the probability that you want to see this wavelength in a certain topic. And now you can go through the different topics found, and you can actually match them with what has been found in the literature, but keep in mind, this was just a machine with a lot of data, right? So not 10 years of two people working hard, it was more like two days of one machine working hard. You can also turn that into word clouds so that you see a little bit better over time how that develops. As said, this is all conforming to plant physiological knowledge. Now, this also means because we are now in the word domain, that we can use other technology that was developed recently, rather recently, um, in machine learning, to understand words and how they relate to each other. And I'm not sure you have heard of deep learning, but this is essentially the shallowest deep network you can imagine, um, and it's called uh, word to vac And it got very famous because it was learning from tons of words, or well, from news articles and, and other textual sources, was learning, um, an algebraic representation, well not algebraic, a geometric representation of words so that you could say, for example, the word king minus man plus uh, woman equals question mark and then because you can just do arithmetics on these embeddings, on these word representation in Euclidean space, the result was queen. So that was pretty amazing for uh, many people that there's so much about how often words co-occur and turning that into an embedding that um, you can do this kind of arithmetic. So here you see the model, again we will not go into it, but you can now, because everything is represented as a word, you can directly apply what we have here, um, this discretized hyperspectral images, and you get the following thing. So we, we computed these embeddings again, and then we do clustering, standard clustering on them. And whenever two <coughs> words, the wavelength and how much energy is reflected have the same color, then this means they quite often co-occur um, in one of these hyperspectral uh, images close by, uh, in one of these signatures close by. And if you now look closer, that's very interesting because you see, for example, red edge phenomena. Um, so it doesn't mean that they have to be close in terms of wavelength, right? So just how often they co-occur um, in the hyperspectral signatures. And you also see here information that is regarded to the chlorophyll and so on and so on. And now you can use that even to do this arithmetic maybe. We haven't done it yet. You may also use that to improve the previous models. But maybe more interesting, at least for me currently, is that we can now think of applying deep learning even further. Um, maybe you heard that from the, from the news again, it got a little bit of attention. Um, so some colleagues from um, OpenAI, they were doing this style transfer. So you take one of your favorite artists, you take your own image, and then you put them both into one of these deep networks, and what you get out is your image painted in the style of the artist. Now we got inspired by that because um, you know, it, it, it's impressive, sure, but somehow it doesn't feel like real science. <laughs> so we were wondering, can we be inspired here and do something that looks at least a little bit more like cool for science? So our idea, our idea was, okay, you have an observed plant. You have some condition of interest. 
can now the machine generate a hyperspectral image of your plant that has a certain condition of interest. Right? So imagine that you're a little bit like an artist and you're inspired uh, by other artists, maybe in our case diseases, and now you get a new plant and you start drawing it in a way that it has this certain disease. I think this is pretty exciting because you, we can now start to think of um, having simulated experiments also in, 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 plant, uh, um, in, in plant science. We can think about, um, I'm not sure that you have the Chemistry Nobel Prize in mind, but actually I was talking to Francis um, two years back, was it, right, in Bonn. So actually, again, I, sh I should thank um, um, Anne because she was introducing me. And so um, Francis and I, we were talking about whether we can use the similar stuff now to have simulated direct evolution, right? So instead of putting everything again into some wet lab and produce everything, maybe several steps can be done by the machine by uh, hallucinating, so to say, how could the experiment look like, and by that reducing the cost of direct evolution. So back then, I, I just thought this is crazy, this cannot work. Now I feel a little bit more comfortable um, that it may work. So I think a machine can do that. So what we did is we used what is called um, a generative adversarial network. So you see that roughly here. The idea of these networks is they are playing a game. So the one network is generating out of noise um, an image, and then the other network is looking just at this produced image and tries to distinguish is that fake or is that coming from a true data set. Right? So you have these two networks playing a game. And now the goal is to optimize those networks, the parameters of both networks in a way that you can't distinguish anymore. And if you have that, you have a generator that can produce something that looks pretty real. So where we are not completely there, but almost, so what we did here is we took the hyperspectral signatures, so not the full images, and then we trained one of these um, generative adversarial networks, but now a special variant that is also producing you a code, a semantic of what is going on there. You will see that in a minute. So uh, we were able, so here you see the code um, trained. So it's a three-dimensional vector per, per pixel, and I hope you see roughly that somehow where you have these spots, you get also different three-dimensional codes. You also see that where the standard healthy parts is, again, you get different codes or RGB values or whatever you want to call it. So somehow this machine has managed to capture the uh, plant physiological knowledge or meaning into the three-dimensional code. But now, more, moreover, these are generative models, right? So what we can do now is we can take any of these pixels, and whenever this code is telling us now this is a healthy spot or a not healthy spot, and one of the dimensions is exactly coding healthy, unhealthy for this particular disease, which I don't recall right now which one it was. Anyhow, we can detect it, and then just in this dimension, we are changing the value now to please be diseased or please be healthy again. Right? And that's what we did here. So we have a disease spots, and now whenever we detected something that is a disease, we change to healthy. And what you get is an image that is looking rather healthy. So we have now a tool that can generate these hyperspectral signatures with meaning. So the other dimensions were about shifting the hyperspectral signature up and down, and the other one was about rotating, right? Because it gets sometimes the shift. So um, what we are currently working on, and I, I happily hope to present you the new results, um, but they are still running. On this image itself, you can put one of these um, generative networks again, and so we can even produce whole images. Um, so I think we are very close to get this really running, that we can generate um, healthy or diseased or whatever you feel is important um, hyperspectral images. So with that, I would like to conclude. Um, yeah, so okay, data is the new soil, and I think machine learning can help, and I think we can even have machine learning biologically plausible processes, but be careful. It doesn't mean that the machine understands in the sense of it can communicate to you what is the process going on there, but we have now a tool where we can play around, and it's not like 
when our first paper got rejected, the reviewer was saying, run some additional experiments. I mean, not for this paper, for back in 2011, run some more data. And I, as a data scientist, said, yeah, yeah, give me data, Jens. And Jens said, yeah, Christian, but the flowering period is next year. So, I said, oh, man. so now maybe I don't have to wait a year, right? And it can start playing around. Additionally, machine learning, at least deep learning, is data hungry. We have now a tool to generate helping data in a sense. So even if you not have enough data for deep learning, maybe we can produce this for you. Um, so in that sense, my dream, and I hope Anna and I will manage, maybe also we should ask Frances again whether she want to join. Uh, I would love to have AI to design and carry out experiments as well as interpret these results. Maybe a little bit crazy, uh, hey, but we are young, so let's, let's go for it. But my main message is really this couldn't be done alone, right? It's not like if people right now tell you, just give me data, I have the AI, and then you have the solution, this is not true. It's still called data mining because you have to get your data, uh, hands dirty, right? You, you have to look at the data, you need knowledge, you need interaction with the domain experts, and this is where you are the key. And it's so much fun working with you, although it's sometimes scary, but I would always do it again. Thank you.